Hello, everybody. Hey. We are live. Welcome We're to the Adobe live. Fonts show. Uh, Welcome. Yes, good to see a lot of people uh, already in the chat. Uh, yeah. I know that music was calming. I wanted to put you in a calming uh, place. Hopefully, didn't lull any of you to sleep. Hopefully, you're uh, <laughs> still awake and with us. And, and uh, yeah, but uh, I hope that was all right. Uh, Ari, how are you? I'm doing good. It's good. early for me, so yes. it's kind of dark. Yeah, thank you. Here. Thank you for joining us so early. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. So for those of you that haven't joined before, I'm Ari. Um, I am the library manager for the Adobe Fonts team. So I work with all of our Foundry partners that provide fonts for our service and deciding which fonts we add. We're always adding new fonts. And we've actually reached over 20,000 fonts in the service which as of today. So that's a pretty incredible number, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. So you have so much to choose from. And I'm located in San Francisco, California. So it's 8 a.m. for me. I'm uh, Ben, located in Brooklyn. I, I am a comp content producer for Adobe Fonts for the team. And started out in support and answered a lot of questions over the years and talking to customers and people about fonts and using our service. And, and then now I'm making things like this so that we can uh, spread the uh, the knowledge of Adobe fonts far and wide um, and uh, get more people excited about type. So we're so glad you could join us. See, we have a lot of people in the audience already. Annika, Andreas, Gareth, Steven, Eric, Odari. Awesome. Thank you all for joining us. Let us know where you're from and yeah, what time it is where you are. <laughs> 11 a.m. for me, so a little bit a uh, little bit less early. The sun is nice and, and lighting me up very nicely right now. So thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Ah, Viola's so, from Brooklyn. Awesome. Yeah, we have another Brooklynite. Excellent. We have Anika's in India. She's always a faithful um chat member here so we're happy to have you back mike is here spreading the font love oh yeah oh yeah yes and so uh oh, you probably jim bond hello bronxville is in the building nice jim bond that's a name wow <laughs> <laughs> um so oh awesome detroit odari welcome that's awesome i love detroit it's a great city. Um, well, we're having a few technical difficulties with the internet from our guest, but we're going to get started and move along and keep things going as we normally do. But if things are a little bit delayed, we'll let you know as things unfold. And we appreciate you all being here with us. This is part of the live stream. Uh, it's part of the, the experience uh, where anything can go wrong at any time. So, so hopefully uh, we'll get uh, our guest set up here pretty soon and otherwise we're going to carry on as as we normally do we've got a poll for you today so this will get a little bit of conversation going uh and our question today in honor of the you know the topic is uh, did you have a childhood hobby that has grown with you into adulthood do you have something from when you were younger that has blossomed later in life and uh, and even if it didn't blossom later in life do you have a a nice memory of a great hobby that you had when you were younger. Um, please share it with us in the chat and let us know. Ari, do you have a, an answer to this question? I, I don't have specific hobbies that I still am interested in. I really liked uh, fashion design when I was young, so I would draw clothes all the time. And I don't do that anymore, but I still draw. It was a form of art, so it morphed into different kinds of art. Nice. What about you? Uh, I'm like Eric, music as a hobby and uh, something I pursued, you know, um, intensely for a couple years in my youth, touring the country and whatnot. So that started out just playing guitar and then turned into being in a band and making records and getting a van and driving around the country. So that was, uh, that definitely went beyond hobby. Um, but uh, yeah, and I still have, the guitars and bass over there and there's synthesizers over there and 
microphones over there and all kinds of stuff. So that definitely stuck with me. It's still something I, I do to this so day. So it became an obsession after being a Yeah, hobby. I think that's a good word for it. Hobby into, into obsession. Yep, pretty much. And I have comic books over there and I have vinyl records over there. So, and, and other things. So there's definitely, um, comics were in my youth as well. Uh, and, and an early hobby too. And same with music, uh, buying music. Um, I have yeah. cassettes and CDs. Speaking of which, do you remember the first CD or, or cassette or, or album that you ever purchased? I do remember. I don't know if it was the first CD I ever bought, but. It was one of the first, and it was Jennifer Lopez on the six. Nice. And on the cover, she's wearing kind of a risque outfit. So I remember mm. wanting to buy that CD, but I was too embarrassed <laughs> to show my dad uh. which CD I wanted. And then when I finally showed him, he didn't react at all. And I was like, why was I so embarrassed? He was like, okay. So that was one of the first CDs I ever bought. Nice. That's a good one. And I love that. I love that anecdote about, you know, feeling like it's so risque, you know, um, and yeah, your dad's just like, whatever, her, here you go. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, what I, are other people saying? We see, I see Cody says gardening, which is a great hobby. And uh, it's good to get your hands dirty and in the soil. Um, <laughs> Eric music, which me as well uh ralph comics awesome so makes sense why you're here drawing for and we I see. think a lot of us yeah i'm sure a lot of people in the chat was drawing yep art and reading art yeah caroline says music and dancing you gave it up you <gasps> can always dance yeah i'm we'll dancing right dance now party. look at that you can dance right now <laughs> Nice. Only reading, says Stefan. I wasn't really allowed allowed anything that cost money, and the library was free. Nice. Yeah. Well, libraries are great for when you're a kid and you have access to all that stuff. Yeah, I think if you're gonna go with something affordable, library is the way to go. Um, and yeah, that's awesome. If Ken says I was fascinated with a small printing press as a child, creating comics and small newsletters. Cool. This toy press had a circular plate with a with an okay, I don't know how to read with an inked master. Next in design and digital art. Nice. That got you into digital. That's cool. We got a lot of dance love happening. First music, vinyl, magic fly. Nice. Nice. And Gareth, I think, said uh comic books early comic book drawings was part of that and slowly getting back into it nice it is cool when when a a childhood hobby or a childhood you know uh creative activity ends up coming back full circle later um i gave up music you know i never i always had my instruments but i kind of gave up playing on a regular basis for like 10 years and then started recently doing that again which has been fantastic so so yeah, well, hopefully this is bringing back some good memories of, of old hobbies, current hobbies, and maybe even thinking about new hobbies. Um, for those of you who've never taken a dance class, I highly recommend it. I've been to an introductory ballet class and an introductory hip hop class. I stuck out like a sore thumb at both, but it was still very fun. And uh, yeah, it was great. So highly recommend it if, uh, if you've ever thought about it. Well, shall we dive into maybe some demo stuff? and um yes awesome so we're still having issues with our um, guest our guest our guest he has he doesn't have issues personally but just his internet, the internet is the issue um <laughs> so we are going to as we usually do jump into showing you a little bit of adobe fonts how it works and we're hoping that we can resolve the issues pretty soon because we're as excited as you to see what our guest has in store. Yes, um, but very much so. I'm just going to take you to the Adobe Fonts website. If you've been here before, this is not news for you. If you've never been to the Adobe Fonts website, hopefully this shows you what's available to you, 
with your Creative Cloud subscription. So all Creative Cloud subscriptions, except for maybe one or two, um, come with uh, Adobe Fonts. So whether it's a single app subscription, like it's just Photoshop, or it's all apps, um, you still get Adobe Fonts. Even if you're a free subscriber, you get access to the free library, which now has almost 2,000 fonts in it. And the full library has over 20,000. So when you get to the home page, you're here. You, I would say when you get here and you just want to explore, go straight to browse fonts. So you click on browse fonts at the top. Um, I have that open already here. And that takes you to the full library with filters so that it can narrow down to find exactly what you need. You might just want to see what's out there, but usually you have a project that you need to get done. So this all helps you. For example, the languages and writing systems, if you have a project that needs to be global and you need fonts that support certain languages, you can go through here and use these filters. We have um, especially for Chinese, Japanese, and Korean specific pages that have different kinds of filters for classifications for those languages. So that's a great little resource for you if you're designing a global campaign or for a company that has offices in other um, regions. And then we have our tags, which are ways to narrow down by a specific type of genre or mood or era. I feel and... like you could probably pick a childhood hobby and one of these tags would help, you know, like you could combine those two things very easily. Like for dancing, yeah. you could do, obviously, you could do something calligraphic or whatever for ballet, or you could do for comics, you could obviously do comic. We have if, a comic tag. <laughs> if you were going to do something like if you were into sci-fi, you could do futuristic and, you know, all that stuff. So. Just feeling, I'm feeling a little bit of a hobby tag tie-in happening here, so. Here, if you click on comic, here are your options. We've gathered some fonts that were created for comics and some of them, they might not have had that intention, but they work in terms of being handwritten or having kind of a bold and um, arresting look. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the tags you can use. And then we have our classifications. So getting down to the basics, hey, I just need a serif. Like, show me the serifs. I don't care if it's shaded or rough <laughs> or rounded or whatever. And then you can narrow down by that filter. And then we have our properties so you can get even more detailed. If you need it to be heavy, you can click on that heavyweight and see only heavy fonts between like bold and black. Oh, <laughs> Camille says, if it's hardcore dancing, you can use black letter. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> like dancing to Swedish metal music. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What does that look like? Let's see. Swedish metal dancing. Yeah. Like Helsinki metal music. Yeah. So Finnish metal. Yes, Finnish metal. Let's go with that. I said Swedish at first, but I think Helsinki is the way to go. Yes. Yes. Oh, Flat Helsinki work. dance class. Oh, I love this so much. I want to go to that dance class. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's kind of how to explore. And then since we, um, we just released this recommendations feature, I just wanted to show really quick. If you want to get inspired and see some recommendations that are curated either for you or just to see what's out there, what's trending, you can go to this tab. All of this is available to you if you have a Creative Cloud subscription. Yep. Even if you're not a paid subscriber, you can come in here and explore and use a subset of the font library for that's available in the basic library. It, so Ari, if you had one of these you. one of these tabs here, the for you trending newest hidden gems staff choice, if you could only use one for the rest of time, which one would it be? Uh probably newest because it's showing everything we recently added. Nice. Um 
you might notice like a lot of them don't have custom images because they're so new and we haven't got a chance to do that. So it's the cutting edge. It's exciting. Like you're pushing boundaries yes. here in the newest tab, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So just since we have our guest today, who is John Rochelle, who is a type designer for Comic Craft, I wanted to show you what our Foundry pages look like. So this is the Comic Craft Foundry page. It has a little bio about the Foundry. It has a little video. And it also has all of the fonts included in this Foundry. So if you liked one of these fonts that you saw, you could then go to this Foundry page and see what else have they designed? What's their style? Maybe I'll like something else. And it's great that we have these images too. Mm -hmm. They really show what the font can do. Um, clobbering time is one of my favorites. It's pretty out there. So yeah, you can look through all of these. Um, and then another thing that we can do is look up our designers for example if we like something that one of these type designers has done we're using a font and we see it's by john rochelle i just looked up his name then i go under designers and there he is and then under his page i can see all the fonts he designed so i can see that there's the one I liked and then, oh, look at all these other things. So it's a great way to explore and see what else someone has designed because chances are they have a similar style for everything they do. So for example, John, he's a comic book guy. All of it is comic book stuff for now. I know he has a wide range as well. So yes. it's not only this, but. For Adobe fonts, this is what we have from him. So you can see on each designer page what we have from them. For a second, and I then, thought the name of the font was Helsinki because I just saw it in the... <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, wait a minute. These can't all be named Helsinki. That doesn't make any sense. There we go. <laughs> no. <laughs> they have far better names than that. Yes. <laughs> so that's how you would explore. And then how to activate fonts. It's super easy. All you have to do is go to the family page. And this is Cinder that I clicked on. It's the number one on the list because it's the list was sorted by featured and it happens to be featured today. So I go here, I can see all the images. And then all I have to do is click activate on this font and it will be available to me in my apps, not only Adobe apps, also my other desktop apps because it gets installed system wide. So it's as easy as that. And if it, I need and to And it will be available project, on mobile on mobile too. If you're using your yes. iPad or Fresco or Illustrator, you'll find it there as well in, in the Creative Cloud app. It's awesome. Yeah, and I was just going to um open a template in Illustrator and try to use some of the fonts there that I activated. So when I click to open this stock template, I get this message because some of the fonts on here, I don't already have active. So the font's called Philosopher. All I have to do is click activate fonts because these fonts are available in the Adobe Fonts Library. Um, and it's easy. Once I click activate, they will show up. Let's see, I didn't actually click it the first time. It's working, it's working. And once those activate, I'm actually gonna change them because I wanna use something else, but it worked. And I can replace them super easily. And I'm gonna see that one that I just activated. There it is, Cinder. And I used it right in there. So then I can change this is, a, I think it's like a fortune teller logo template. Um, so maybe I'll put fortunes. 
and then I can change, you know, this text as well. I can change it to something else, but I want to try um, this other font that is kind of new. That's by our one of our other Foundry partners that we had as a guest last week, Delve. It's from Delve Fonts. Oh, it looks so good. And yeah, it's called Tuppence. And I really wanted to use this on something. I'm like, oh, maybe this will work. Yes, but I want to write my own thing. What should I write under here, everybody? Fortunes. Hmm. What's the slogan for fortunes? Let's see. What does everybody have to say? <laughs> I'm going to say your future. Or futures. I didn't do that on purpose, but I like it. <laughs> All right, Mohammed from Cape Town, South Africa. Hi. So we, I think we have our guest slowly coming in, everybody. So stay tuned. It's happening. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to keep on working on this. Let's see. This. This font philosopher is available from Google fonts. So it's actually in our free library and this was a free template. So it makes sense that it was included here because it's available to everybody, whether or not you're a paid subscriber. Um, and one thing that we've shown before from Illustrator that is really cool is you can access the full Adobe fonts library through Illustrator. So if I click on find more, it's actually going to show me everything and I can use filters. For example, let's look for a sans. Ari, I think we and are then, ready to go if you want to uh, dive in with our guest. And um, all right, we're yes. ready. We're going to we're going to bring is everybody excited. Is everyone excited? We're going to bring John right in so we can get started right away. John, welcome to the Adobe Fonts show. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad to have made it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was quite the journey, I'm sure. Uh, it was a little hairy, but you did uh, it. you're here. Yeah. <laughs> A little hairy. <laughs> it was hairy can you tell and my... you have your hair on. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I feel was... like you were very stressed. It's obvious. I... We can see. <laughs> I, I was totally, totally brown before I left. I woke up this morning. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for joining us. Your yeah. hair went white from the stress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Ari, would you give us a really quick introduction just about John and we'll dive right into the topic since we are uh, running a little bit short on time. Uh, due to the uh, delay. So yes. Yeah. John is one of our Foundry partners. Um, he has created a few fonts that are in the Adobe Fonts Library. And he has also lettered thousands of comics for mm -hmm. Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, and Blizzard. He's designed the logos for Avengers, Daredevil, Black Panther, and Angry Birds. Um, and he has created typefaces for Comic Craft, which is on our service and also his new foundry swell type. So he has expanded into different genres of type. Um, but today he's going to be showing us his techniques for creating authentic comic book pages. So let's dive in. I think it took you a while, John, because you were in the future yeah. <laughs> and then you came back. <laughs> right? That's okay. right. You know, if I had the if I had the time traveling DeLorean, I would have been right on time, though. That's okay. true. Yeah, you could have <laughs> timed it perfectly. So, all right. Well, let's dive in, and uh, let's see what you got for us. Okay. Um, so, I was the first uh, thing I was going to show you guys is just take you through the basic steps of lettering a comic book page. Um, so, I have a page of artwork up here loaded into Illustrator. Um, it's just placed onto. And I've got some layers set up. It's the artwork file is just placed here onto the artwork layer, which I like to keep locked so it doesn't accidentally uh, move around. Nice. And then I have four other layers set up here for different um, layers of the balloons and the text. So first thing I'm going to do is get some text from the script. Um, so I'll get the text layer selected here and come over to my script file. 
So usually when uh, pros are lettering comics, we get the artwork from the artist and we get the script from the writer and it's our job to combine those elements into the final comic book. So we're here in panel two. Um, and, oh my God, yesterday I cut the dialogue that I was going to use. <laughs> I think it said, oh yeah. Give me one I think second. it said, um, it let go of her. I insist. Dare so, you or something. All right, so there's a little sneak preview. Pretend you didn't see that. <laughs> okay. So normally we would get, uh, here I would copy the dialogue. So does this dialogue, it gets sent to you by someone else in this format? Uh, yeah, I mean, they'll send them in all kinds of form. We'll get PDFs, we'll get Word files, we'll get cocktail napkins. I mean, it's just <laughs> <laughs> all sorts of things, whatever whatever the writer likes to work in. Uh, but as long as, yeah. we can, as long as we can copy and paste it, we're, it's, uh, we're in pretty good shape. Nice. So here on my text layer, I'm just going to click using the text tool. Just click and drag a, a bounding box for the text, and I'll paste my text in there. And I'm going to hide the art layer so we can see it a little bit better. Cool. Um, so I'm going to center the text, which Command Shift C, and I go to my character palette, and I'm going to choose uh, Meanwhile, which is one of the fonts, one of our fonts that's in the Adobe Fonts Library. And this is a font that's designed specifically for the purpose of lettering comic books. And you can see it's all uppercase and there's two versions of each letter um, in the upper and the lower case. So if I type two E's, you can see they're slightly different there. Cool. Mm -hmm. Upper and lower case. And then the really cool thing is in the open type features, um, we have it, we have a program to automatically um, swap some letters around. So you can see when I turn on the open type features here, um, the, the two S's in insist are slightly different. Yeah. And the, and the N in horn swaps around. And if there were any letters next to each other, it would swap one of those. So you never see two letters in a row that are exactly the same. Nice. And kind of, kind of makes cool it more like real real uh, lettering, right? Like, like as if they would never be exactly the same. Yeah, exactly. Them. Yeah. Exactly. So a pen letterer would, would be getting slightly different results each time. And you know, we've done some fonts where you get into three and four alternates just to get really clever about it. But I think two is usually enough to just kind of not be distracting. Um, and, and also, um, you know, just give a little bit of that randomness. And the other cool thing that we have programmed in the open type features is it automatically puts the crossbar I character for the word I, which is a comic book tradition um, where the, the word I has the, has the crossbars on top and bottom, but you would never, ever, ever put a crossbar I in the middle of a word um, like that. Is that to save space? Yeah, I think, I think actually the crossbars on the I were meant to indicate that it wasn't a number one or an exclamation point. Mm. So it was more for a readability thing. But then putting them in the middle of a word is kind of unnecessary. So if you ever see a crossbar I in the middle of a word, you know that it was like an amateur attempt at lettering. That's one of the that's one um, of the things that jumps out at me when I'm when I'm looking at things that are sort of supposed to look like comic books, but you know, don't quite get it right. So that's one of the things you can make sure not to put any crossbar eyes in the middle of words. Nice. Okay. Everybody keep note. There you go. There's, there's, yes. Or see. you use meanwhile and then it'll do it for you. So exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We're trying to eradicate those crossbar eyes as much as we can. Um, so the cool thing about the bounding box text in Illustrator is you can kind of grab it and reshape the text block. But then I still tend to go back with hard returns and to kind of shape it, work. shape it the way you want. Exactly, and you mm -hmm. basically want the shortest lines on the top and the bottom, and then the, the longest line should be in the middle of the word. So it so it kind of already looks like an oval, yeah. Um, even before we draw the oval. And the other thing I'll try to do if I can is, is just put the returns after punctuation because those are natural pauses in the speech anyways. So it kind of enhances the reading experience, I think, if you can get them after the punctuation. Cool. Yeah. All right. So let's turn the artwork, turn the artwork back on. Oh, where's my mouse? There it is. All right. And we'll draw a balloon. So Ooh. I'm going to get the... Right ellipse tool here and set the colors to white fill black stroke 
over in the toolbar. And basically just, whoops. And then I'm going to go to the balloon bottom layer and then click and drag. Cool. And so there's two ways to draw an ellipse. One is from the top left like that. Or if you hold down the option key, you can drag it right from the center, which I find a little more uh, easy to get right on the first try. Now you did that. You, you said you That's held down the center. Far better. The, uh, you hold down option. option key. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And then it draws from the center. And generally, turn off the art for a second. The stroke width on the balloon should be about the same as the width of as the stroke on the letters, um, simply because you figure a pen letter would be using the same pen to draw the balloons that they were using to letter the uh, letter the words. So if I go up to two point, it's a little too thick. One's maybe a little too skinny. So I'll go point and a half, and that looks like a pretty good match there. Hmm. Um, and then the technique we use, which I'm going to show you, another um, pro lettering tip, is we construct our balloons in two layers. And so we'll make the bottom layer have twice as much stroke as we want. Then I'm going to copy, paste in front. So it's pasted another identical balloon right on top. And then I'm going to move that up to the balloon top layer and get rid of the stroke. And so what we have is a white balloon on top. If I select that. And then we have the thicker stroked balloon underneath it. Okay. And the reason we do this is because then as you're going along in your lettering and you want to join two balloons, you can just grab this whole chunk of objects, option drag, and they're automatically connected. Ooh. So, so that cool. Is, so, so that is a key. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Just to be clear, how you did this was you have the original balloon you made below and then mm -hmm. the same exact size balloon right above it but without the stroke, and that allows you to do this. Exactly. So if so I hide cool. the balloon top layer, you can see the bottom layer yeah. ones down there and then the, the white one on top. So that's a huge time saver. Um, yeah, that's a really cool little trick. Um, we have a question from Mark. Yeah. Mark says, isn't the space before the double dash unnecessary? So that is a matter of preference. Um, is that a controversial statement? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's been the subject of any like punch, knockdown, drag out fights, but um, <laughs> some writers will in, will want the space gone. Some writers will want the space there. So it's usually just comes down to the preference of the letterer, preference of the writer. Um, a lot of times writers will have very specific um, ideas about how they want their lettering to look, even down to, you know, helping you choose the fonts and, um, balloon styles and all that sort of different levels of involvement. Some writers will just say, we trust you, go for it, do, do your thing. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much a matter of preference. Um, oh, the, other, the other thing I forgot to do here is to bold. I'm going to emphasize some words here. Um, I'll go back to my text palette and we'll make horn louder. And to do that, we'll put it in bold italic. Ah, so loud. So there we go. Whoa. Um, and that, that's another comic book tradition, which I think is left over from the from the bad print quality days, which is when you emphasize a word, rather than just bold it, you bold italic it, and that kind of gives it an extra level of, um, you know, differentiation to stand out a little more from the regular text. Right. So even if the printing was kind of so-so, you would still right. know that that word was emphasized, even if it... Exactly. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Like some, sometimes I'll open up old comics and the, the print quality is so inconsistent from page to page. You, you know, what looks bold on one page is light on another. Yeah. But that's part of the charm, I guess. All right. So we got our, we'll get our artwork back. And so this is Flask here. Hip Flask is the character talking. And I will draw the tail, which is what indicates who's speaking this balloon. So I'll click on my tail layer. Go back and set white fill, black stroke. I'll get the pen tool. And I'm going to start at this about the center of the balloon and just click once. And then I'm going to go about halfway to the character's mouth. You never want the tail to be like, it doesn't need to be all the way inside their mouth. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I don't want it so short that you maybe you're not sure who's talking. So as a general rule, I go about halfway to their head or halfway to their mouth. And just click again. There we go. And then go back inside the balloon and click and drag the handle just a little, just to give it a little bit of a curve. And there's a tail. Cool. 
And the cool thing about this layer method is the tail is its own object. So I can grab it, I can move it around. Um, and it's not, you know, physically attached to the rest of the balloon. So if I, if I hide the balloon top, you can see that there's the tail there and then the balloon top is covering them all right. up. That white balloon top al allows this effect because it's above the tail. That's just so cool. I've exactly, never seen yeah. anyone yeah. do that. It's awesome. <laughs> Um, so there's a pretty good looking comic book balloon, but there's two things I think we can do to make it look even more authentic. And the first one is, I'm going to select, select the text here and then the character palette. And you can see that by default, Illustrator puts auto letting, um, which is if you've got 12 point type, the auto letting is about 14 and a half. And that's too much for comics. There's just too much space in between the lines. So I'm going to drop that down to about 13. Let's see what that looks like. Can even go maybe to 12 over 12, which looks, a, looks like a little bit tight. So I'm going to go 12 and a half. We and have again, a question yeah. um, from Ralph saying, don't I need to set the lower balloon stroke attribute to overprint? Oh, yeah. I was going to I was going to mention that. So we'll get there. Nice. Good nice job, Ralph. question, Ralph. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You're pro letterer, Ralph. Um, You're trolling me. <laughs> so when you fix the the letting there okay. is that just because you try to fit as much text as possible yeah that's exactly and... it you, you basically want to f you want the text to be readable and you don't want to cover any more art than you have to um, so right. it's a matter of just kind of making it compact but still readable and since in this case we're, we're using all uppercase font we can get the lines really close we don't have to worry about ascenders and descenders mm -hmm. colliding um, if you're lettering up or lower case, you would probably want to have a bit more lettering. And sometimes you need to even, you know, add spaces to just kind of shift lines around to get those ascenders and descenders to cooperate. Mm. But all uppercase is, is definitely more straightforward. And then the other little tip I'm going to show you is let's lock the, the lock the text layer and get the direct selection tool here, which is the closed arrow. And I'm going to click and drag over each quadrant of the of both balloons. So you can see the, the little Bezier handle showing up there. And get the scale tool. And I'm going to click right in the center of the balloon and then off to the side here and just drag out. And what this does, wow. <laughs> actually that's, oh. that'd make kind of a cool like like a telepathic balloon maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, then so the this... artist is going to be like, why are you covering so much of my art? <laughs> yeah, with your crazy fancy balloons, balloon. your show off. Um, <laughs> So we, these, we call them TV-shaped balloons, which if you're old enough to remember when TVs were kind of had these round corners. Um, and Cathode what that does ray is, tubes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they were huge and they were they got hot. And so what that does is it just gives you a little bit more room inside your balloon to fit text and, with, and, and lets you make the balloon even more compact. So if I select both balloons again, I can kind of just shrink them down a little bit more. And it's just mm. a bit more of a compact shape there. Um, and then it also just looks a, a little more natural, a little bit more like somebody would have drawn it um, by hand. They wouldn't have drawn a perfect ellipse without a some kind of template. So nice. get you that kind of hand drawn look. So there's that is a pretty good looking balloon. Uh, it good looks legit it looks to me. Great. So <laughs> <laughs> Ben stamp of approval. Uh, yes. it's not a lot of text there. I'm going to move it down so it's just off. I don't want to have any tangents with the artwork either, just so that it looks like it's, they should always look like they're floating in space rather than looking like they're kind of anchored to the to the art in any way. Um, and then let's uh, move on to doing a sound effect. So over here in my script, you see there's sound effects indicated for the zoom, which I assume is the sound of these panels opening up in the floor. And then you got your snap, snap, snaps for the hungry crocodiles beneath. So I'll just grab the copy to zoom and text tool. In this case, I'm not going to draw a bounding box. I'm just going to click once um, and then paste the text in. And the advantage of this is now if I grab the corners, it actually scales the text rather oh. than enlarging the bounding box. So for sound effects, that's a lot more useful. Yeah. And in this case, I'm going to grab a font that's designed specifically for making sound effects, um, which is Biff Bam Boom. Biff Bam Boom. Also in the Adobe Fonts library. Nice. Um, and let's set it to white fill black stroke. 
And then for the color on the sound effect, I like to pick something that's gonna contrast with the background, um, just so it shows up, but that's also a color that's already on the page so that it, there's some sort of harmony within the, you know, within the page overall. Um, so just kind of looking at the page, there's kind of that deep red of his vest. Hmm. Let's give, give that a try. So maybe like a hundred, hundred red. What does the chat think? Let us know what color you think yeah. we should make the text. Yeah, I'll give it a try. <laughs> so to me, I mean, actually he's kind of disappearing against the floor. So yeah, the, yeah. the reddish floor is kind of swallowing it up. Yeah. So maybe let's maybe let's try like a brighter like the gold down in the bottom panel. So maybe oh that's pretty good. Looks better. Yeah, that kind of kind of pops, but it's also you know present in the overall composition. Uh, what do you think? Anybody else have any color suggestions? <laughs> Not yet. All right. We'll try it if they do. I think uh, this is good. Yeah, I'm digging, all right, the, so I'm I'm, digging the gold. <laughs> I'll go with that for now. Um, and you can see this font also has the open type automatic substitution ligature, so it's popping in a slightly different M every other time. Ooh. So a little fancy tip there. It looks like it's dancing. <laughs> you can do some animation. Get the soundtrack going. Um, and then this is a really cool tip for sound effects and when i showed you guys on the practice you didn't even know this existed because it's usually buried in the type menu it's called the touch type tool and it's not on by default so you may have to go over here to the drop down menu turn on the touch type tool and what this lets you do mm -hmm. oh when i click on touch type tool i can grab any letter in a text block and i haven't created outlines it's just all it's doing is this is really awesome so awesome Everyone, go turn on the touch type tool in Illustrator <laughs> right now. And it even lets you, you can make letters bigger. You can Whoa. scooch them around. Um, so I'll make That's that. really cool. And I feel like if you wanted to, you know, if you were experimenting with customizing maybe something for a logo, this could be a great tool to just get a quick idea of what might work and resizing and kind of tightening things up or anyways. Yeah. So useful. Yeah, it's cra it's crazy easy, and all you, all it's really doing you can even see as I'm as I'm moving stuff around. It's just adjusting baseline shift and and scale on the fly. Wow! So it's everyone in the chat is very impressed. Yes. <laughs> Whoa! Super cool. And I think um, a lot of people liked the gold text. Okay. Abu Taleb says usually sound texts sound texts are yellow. Is that true? I'd say yellow is a color that can almost always work. If you go warm colors, yeah. reds, reds, yellows, oranges, it's almost always going to stand out. I'd say the exception is maybe if I'm doing like water, if it's a splash or something, maybe I'll go with a blue just because it it suggests the thing that it's representing. Um, but yeah. yeah, I'd say yellow is a pretty safe bet, but you wouldn't want to have yellow sound effects in the whole comic either. That gets kind of boring. So, And honestly, white is not is sometimes the best option. So... Um, cool. yeah, so there's that. And then, um, I'm going to put it on, so we got it on the tail layer, which is fine. I'm going to do another copy paste in front and I'm going to set the stroke. I'm going to up the stroke to a little bit too thick and then I'm going to move it to a layer underneath. And what that does is it creates a oh. sound effect where it's got a thick outline, but you still have a thinner mm -hmm. line in between the, um, in between the letters and I'm going to select both of those guys and I'm going to give them round caps and corners because cool. it just looks a little more like so a pen. really quick what you did was is you you copied exactly what you had uh -huh. you put it on top you made the stroke bigger and then you moved that yep. below so that now that larger stroke one is behind the original exactly so cool. if I hide the tail layer there's the thicker stroke one and then on top is the thinner stroke one and nice. that that is Cody paste is in asking... front Command F right there, which oh. is key. That just pastes. If you copy something, it pastes it in exactly the same location. Oh, uh, asked, questions? is that touch type tool also in Photoshop? Good question. I don't know. Oh. We'll check when oh, we get there. Someone says no. Abu Taleb says no. Unfortunately, so no. maybe not. Dang. Maybe you guys know somebody who can uh, hey, get on that. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to ask the Adobe gods. Um, since we're we're a little short on time. Yeah. Should we, speaking of Photoshop. Yes. 
Should we go in there and show a little bit of yeah, we have making it. this page more authentic? We have okay. about five minutes left oh my gosh. Okay. or so. But we um, will go fast. Yeah. So if I if we were lettering a comic, traditionally this would be where you'd stop, but I'm gonna go, I'm gonna bring it into Photoshop just to have some fun with effects. So I'm just gonna grab my Illustrator yeah. file here and I'm gonna drag it over to Photoshop. Audience take note that John just dragged the actual Illustrator file directly into Photoshop, and that works totally fine. Just yep. I thought that was super cool. <laughs> so. And then I'm gonna set the set the color mode to CMYK, 300 DPI is good, anti-alias is fine. And so now we are in, we have opened our Illustrator file in Photoshop and it's all pixels. Uh, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab my black channel. I'm going to cut it, go back to the all the channels, layers. And again, um, paste in place is the way to do it in Photoshop, which paste it in exactly the same spot. Set it, set it to multiply. And basically, we'll need this later, but basically the, one of the things it lets us do is adjust the opacity of the black. So the black, we can make the black a little bit faded. Kind of vintage looking. Yeah, so it's already getting a little more vintagey there. Um, yeah. Second thing I'm gonna do is open a, this is a file I scanned earlier, which is just a sheet of paper in my scanner. Come on. That's great. I think more people need to use their scanners because a lot of people buy textures online or download them and right. it's super and easy. To, you, everyone has a piece of paper. And I've even, I've put objects in the scanner. Like it actually makes a decent camera. It has kind of a cool effect for that too. But um, this is just a sheet of printer paper in the scanner. And if you take the, if I take my levels and just bring that black point Whoa. up, you actually get some pretty interesting stuff going on. Here. <laughs> so I'm going to select all copy, close that file up. And I'm going to paste it into our art file here. I'm just going to bring it up and just scale it. So it covers the whole page. And I'm going to set this guy to multiply as well. So wow. now we can, you can see that page is starting to get some Texture to it, and this is probably way too much texture. So you can just use the opacity controls. There's none, and I can kind of dial in as much paper texture as I want nice. with the opacity there. So cool. Like thirty percent looks. Karan says you can also use Adobe Scan with your phone or yeah. Adobe Capture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, your phone. Um, I mean, the camera on the phone is probably going to work just as well. So yeah, I have. For Mike, Abu Taleb, Karen, they're all using their phones to grab textures. So yeah, if you cool. see like a old gate or like a weird wooden door, snap a picture of that too. It makes cool textures. Um, I actually forgot to talk about overprinting, which I just realized. Um, so I'm going to just go back to Illustrator real quick, and the way we overprint is when the page is done. I'm going to select all, and go to Edit, Edit Colors, Overprint Black. And the defaults are fine, and that's that way you don't have to overprint as you're going along. Awesome. Um, oh, yeah. okay. And we'll see why. Luckily, in a there's a replay, so people can. <laughs> so we'll see why in a second, which is you can. And the reason I it, what reminded me of is is if I shift my black layer here, it's going to create white halos underneath where the black is, and if you overprint it, it actually lets the color, the CMY, show show underneath the K. Cool. So. So for printing quality, you the black like kind of overprint, like it. Well, obviously it overprints, but it covers yeah. up. It covers up all those borders because it's the top layer. Yeah, exactly. Nice. It's basically printing over the CMY, so you don't have those halos, um, which in most comics you want to avoid. Uh, but in this case, we are we have no overprinting, so we'll get even more of a comic booky effect when we get there. Um, so I'm going to take this paper layer and I'm going to duplicate it. Just Command J just creates a copy of it. I'm going to invert it. Command I, and so now if I get it up to full opacity in normal mode, you can see this is the paper texture inverted. It's just got a little, lot of little scratches and nicks and things. And if I set that to screen blending mode, then it, it's adding in little scratches all over the artwork. So cool. that's with here's turning it off and there's turning it on. Um, and again, you can use your opacity control to dial in as much scratches as you want. Um, and then I'm going to add some yellowing. 
and this is new fill layer solid color. Just call it yellow. And I'm going to set this CMYK. I like to get again that golden, that golden yellow color works great. And set it to multiply. And it's way too much. This comic is. <laughs> this is a really <laughs> old comic, and it might have been yeah. in a dumpster somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't even. You can't even touch it. It's too valuable. Yeah, this is a toxic. Fall apart if you touch is, it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just going to use opacity control, so there's none, no yellowing, and then you can just kind of dial in as much yellowing of the so page cool. as you want. Yeah. So somewhere around there, 30, 40, 50 percent awesome. gets you that yellowy look. But it would not be a comic book without half tone dots so yes hit yeah. us with the half tone dots in the last minute that we have all right yes uh, half tone dots <laughs> gonna like, okay so i'm gonna i created a new layer in the layers palette i'm command delete which just fills it with white um and then we'll go back to our black and i'm going to shift delete to fill it with 50 percent so all that did is created a gray just a Make them visible. It's just gray, just a gray layer. Cool. And then I'm going to filter, uh, pixelate, color half tone, and it's set to eight pixels. And what that does is creates half tone dots. And I'll turn my other layers back on, and I'm going to set this layer to overlay, which is the best of the blending modes, in my humble opinion. Nice. And what you get is a lot of half tone dots on it. If, for example, you think those dots are too coarse, you could go back. Just do this process again and choose, you know, set the dots to 10 or 12 um, pixels, or you could drop mm -hmm. it down to five or four if you want them to be finer. Um, but so awesome. this, this, this looks pretty good. And I'm going to use that opacity control to and just kind of. John, reduce. would you really quick take us back from the original all the way up to here super fast? Yes. Well, the last thing I need to do is grab the black layer and I'm just going to move it around so we get that kind of offset. Cool. <laughs> misregistered thing. <laughs> and then if we turn all the textures off, there's our color art, halftone dots, textures and yellowing. Awesome. There we go. So cool. That looks so good. <laughs> the sound oh. effect actually looks kind of cool with the Uber printing off. <laughs> uh, it looks awesome. Um, I'm gonna share your links really fast. At Comicraft on Twitter and on Instagram, comicbookfonts.com. Please go check out John's work. Uh, someone mentioned that John has some tutorials on lynda.com that were worth checking out. That sounds incredible. This was so awesome, John. Thank you for making this happen. And uh, oh, thanks for thanks for, for hosting sharing thanks for all having this me. awesome stuff. Um, everyone, if you enjoyed this, follow us on Behance to hear about any new streams that we're doing. We would love to have John back in the future. And if you enjoyed this, let us know on Twitter or on Behance or anywhere so that we know the kind of topics you're interested in. And again, John, this was so, so, so cool. Thank you again. Really awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we're getting great feedback from the chat. Everyone loved it. So thank you everyone for joining. Yeah, thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.